To continue on from the previous episode, here is part two of Into the Unknown. A much more bizarre story was supposedly told by an unnamed family who had sighted a UFO. Some time after the sighting, they said that they were visited by a very strange individual. Ivan Sanderson, who reported the incident in his book, Uninvited Visitors, described the individual as thus. Almost seven feet tall with a small head, dead white skin, enormous frame, but pipe stem limbs. This oddity said that he was an insurance investigator and that he was looking for someone who had the same name as the husband of this family. He indicated that the man he was looking for had inherited a great deal of money. Sanderson continued, This weird individual just appeared out of the night wearing a strange fur hat with a visor and only a light jacket. He flashed an official looking card on entry but put it away immediately. Later on when he removed his jacket he disclosed an official looking gold shield on his shirt which he instantly covered with his hand and removed. The strange visitor asked some personal questions about the family but nothing at all about the UFO. The creepiest part of the whole affair came when the eldest daughter of the family notices that the investigator's tight pants had ridden up his skinny legs and she saw a green wire running out of his sock, up his leg and into the flesh at two points. After the interview, the investigator got into a large black car which contained at least two other persons and that seemed to appear from an old dirt road that led from the woods. The car drove off into the night with its headlights off. In addition to scaring and intimidating people, visits of MIBs are also supposed to produce a variety of unpleasant physical symptoms. Bender said he'd suffer from headaches, lapses of memory and was plagued by strange odours following the first visit of the men in black. Others, who say they've had similar visitations, have made similar complaints. Another eerie thing attributed to MIB types is the ability to look like anyone they want to. Some UFO researchers claim that MIBs have been posing as them in order to silence potential witnesses. John Keel, who has written a number of UFO books, said that he had encountered people who refused to believe that he was who he said he was. John Keel said... Later, contactees began to whisper to local UFO investigators that the real John Keel had been kidnapped by a flying saucer and that a cunning android, who looked just like me, had been substituted in my place. Incredible though it may sound, this was taken very seriously, and later, even some of my more rational correspondents admitted that they had carefully compared the signatures on my current letters with pre-rumour letters that they had received. As we said earlier, each era tries to explain strange encounters in terms of its own system of beliefs. I've been struck by the similarity of some of these MIB cases with medieval tales of encounters with the devil or some of his demons. The devil, for example, was very often described as a man dressed in black. The ability to change shape and appear in any form was commonly attributed to demons who were able to take the shape of a victim's friend and neighbours and even assume the likeness of angels and saints. Many of those who said that they'd met the devil complained of the same range of physical symptoms reported by those who encountered the MIBs. The shiny new cars associated with MIBs is reminiscent of the Haitian belief in an evil society of sorcerers called Zobops. Haitians say that if you see a big new car going along the road without a driver, it's under the control of the Zobops and you are better not to try to interfere with it. Now I'm not trying to imply that the men in black are agents of the devil, or vice versa, any more than I would try to say that the little green men from Mars were really the fairy folk of past generations. It's just that our visions and fears often remain the same over the ages, and only our explanations for them change. Of course, encounters with the devil during the Middle Ages were generally more frightening and overpowering experiences than current experience with MIBs. Everybody believed in the devil, while today everybody doesn't believe in the creatures from outer space. Medieval society took devil stories in dead earnest and anyone who made such a report might find himself facing a painful death at the stake. The worst one can expect from reporting an MIB encounter is a certain amount of disbelief and ridicule. In general, MIB tales are considered too bizarre even to be reported in local newspapers. They're published only in magazines and books put out for and by UFO enthusiasts. Usually, such publications are privately printed and are read only by a few hundred. A few books, however, have been issued by major publishers and have reached a far wider audience. These cases are also occasionally discussed on radio and TV talk shows, so the information gets around more widely than one might think. A lot of people have heard of something about MIBs without really knowing any of the details. There's one incident which bared certain similarities to the traditional MIB case that did receive very wide publicity. This is the story of the kidnapping of Betty and Barney Hill. While most of the MIB cases do not appear directly to involve a UFO, this one certainly does. 
the couple were driving to their home in Portsmouth, New Hampshire from Canada on the night of September the 19th, 1961. They were on an isolated stretch of road when they spotted what they thought was a flying saucer above them. They then followed two completely blank hours in their lives. They could remember nothing from the time they saw the UFO until a time two hours later when they found themselves in the car several miles down the road from where they'd first seen the UFO. For months after this experience, both of the Hills suffered from severe psychological distress. Finally, they consulted a psychiatrist who hypnotised them and under hypnosis the Hills revealed the strange story of being kidnapped and taken aboard a flying saucer. The Hills didn't rush out and try to get publicity about their experience or write a book about it. In fact, they were remarkably quiet. But the incident did ultimately come to the attention of Arthur John Fuller, who had already written an extremely popular UFO book. With the cooperation of the Hills and of their psychiatrist, Fuller produced another bestseller, The Interrupted Journey, which was first serialised in the now defunct Look magazine. Though the book is carefully hedged with qualifications that the experience described might be a hallucination or a dream rather than a totally real and true experience, the distinct impression left by The Interrupted Journey on thousands of readers was that the experience was a totally real and true one. The people, or entities, that were supposed to be controlling the spaceship that kidnapped the Hills can be squeezed into the Men in Black law. Barney Hill described one of his captors as looking like a red-headed Irishman, hardly an MIB type, but another wore a shiny black coat with a black scarf thrown around his neck. Under hypnosis, Hill drew a picture of the leader of his abductors. It's a strange insect-like face with a wide, thin mouth and huge slanting eyes that seem to go halfway around the creature's head. The eyes were the most frightening part of the saucer inhabitant's strange physiology. Once, during a hypnotic session with a psychiatrist, Barney cried out in terror, Oh, those eyes! They're in my brain! Glowing eyes, you will recall, are considered one of the key characteristics of the typical men in black. Unlike many of the books written by or about people who say they had encountered the inhabitants of UFOs, the interrupted journey carries real conviction. One gets the feeling that the Hills and Fuller are intelligent, sincere and sane people who really believe what they described is what actually did happen. So this idea was planted in the minds of thousands of readers of The Interrupted Journey. UFOs can land, the extraterrestrials can kidnap ordinary people, subject them to a degrading and almost brutal examination and then wipe all memory of the incident from their minds, leaving behind only an unexplained sense of anxiety bordering on panic. Well what does all this mean? Are we being invaded by some weird bunch of extraterrestrials who have, in the words of the old shadow radio show, the power to cloud men's minds? Frankly, the evidence doesn't support such an alarming conclusion. Are all the stories hoaxes and hallucinations? Psychiatrists could certainly have a field day with many of these accounts. Symptoms such as loss of memory, severe anxiety and other unpleasant reactions strongly suggest that many of those who report such experiences are in a disturbed psychological state though they would claim that the disturbance was caused by the encounter with the strange visitor. In any event, they do not make the most reliable of witnesses. Some of the other stories are almost certainly sheer fiction, made up either by some practical joker or by a writer of sensational books. Whether all the stories are real or unreal is not a question that we can answer conclusively here. The point is that there's now a mythology being built, just as it was in Europe many years ago in the Middle Ages with their tales of dragons, ogres and elves, and also other parts of the world with their legends of folklore as well. In our modern day we've prided ourselves on being a practical, hard-headed, no-nonsense sort of people who are immune to irrational fears and superstitious notions of less clear-sighted and realistic folk. This proposition is demonstrably untrue, and perhaps we're better off for it. Our monsters, our space people, even if they don't exist, if indeed they are rather silly, make life a little bit more interesting and exciting.